as the countdown to Mars continues. The perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the red planet. What comes up must come down. That was NASA's Perseverance rover launching from Cape Canaveral back in July. Its final destination, you heard it, Mars. After seven months and 292 million miles, the rover is finally set to touch down on the red planet Thursday afternoon. It's a landing many scientists say will be a difficult one. For more on this, I want to bring in Bill Harwood. He's our CBS News space analyst and joins me from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Hi, Bill. It's always fun to talk to you about uh, space and all the exciting things that go on in it. Thursday's landing will not be an easy one. In fact, scientists behind the mission are calling the atmospheric entry and landing seven minutes of terror. <laughs> talk to us about what the landing is going to look like and why it's so difficult. Yeah, you know, it's always remarkable to think about what they're trying to pull off here. They're taking this 2,000-pound spacecraft, they're positioning it directly in front of Mars. Mars is essentially going to run into Perseverance. And so from the point that it hits the top of the atmosphere, moving at about 12,100 miles an hour, down to the surface will take seven minutes, as you said. But during that seven minutes, Multiple things have to happen. They all have to happen pretty much perfectly. The heat shield has to work. This giant parachute they're going to use to slow down at more than twice the speed of sound at that point has to inflate properly. And then they've got a rocket powered jet pack that's going to come down to the surface and lower the rover down onto its wheels. All of that happens in seven minutes. And because Earth is 127 million miles from Mars right now, it takes radio signals 11 minutes to cross that distance. So the flight engineers out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory can't provide any real-time control. The rover is completely on its own. The flight computer has to orchestrate all this and pull it off. And as you said, they call it seven minutes of terror for a reason. It's, a, it's an anxiety-producing moment for sure. Yikes, that sounds harrowing. Is there a plan B if one of those things doesn't happen the way it's supposed to? <laughs> no, it all, it all pretty much has to work. I mean, there are some things they can deal with. They can lose communications, for example. The computer can freeze up like yours does occasionally. Uh, but, but it's programmed to fly itself all the way down without any uh, interaction with the flight controllers on Earth. Uh, but hopefully it's all going to work correctly. They used a similar technique back when Curiosity landed in 2012. Uh, they're hoping it's going to work this time, but it's a particularly difficult spot to land. So I think people are a little extra nervous this time around. And let's just say, look, I'm an optimistic person. I think it's all going to go just fine. But let's just say for some reason it doesn't. Is that end of mission? Is that, you know, is there anything that could come out of it if the landing doesn't go as expected? Well, there's a lot of things that could happen in the sense you can have instruments fail, you know, maybe it can't rove as far as they might want to, things like that, in which case you would still get some science out. But, you know, basically the spacecraft has to get down to the surface intact. Um, if any of those major events on the way down don't work, uh, the odds of success are very small, and, and they know that. You know, there are no guarantees on a flight like this, and they put a lot of time and effort uh, and money, $2.4 billion into this, uh, to make sure it'll work properly. But again, no guarantees. This is really cutting edge exploration on a world, you know, more than 100 million miles away. And at the end of the day, this thing just has to work or they'll have to go back to the drawing board. We're all going to be on the edge of our seats watching it. So um, assuming the landing does go smoothly, what types of samples will the rover be looking for once it's actually there on the red planet? Right. Well, you know, that's, that's what really makes this such an interesting mission. They have, they have decided to land in a crater. There's a 28-mile crater there, Jezero, that once held a lake. And they think it's about the size of Lake Tahoe, hundreds of feet deep. And orbital photographs show where a river channel cuts through the rim and fans out in a broad delta in this crater. All the water's gone now, of course, but if there was microbial life there in the distant past, the remnants undoubtedly would have filtered down and may still be preserved in these lake bed sediments, the sediments of that delta. So the rover is going to go explore that region. It's going to try to uh, look at that lake bed, maybe climb up on top of that delta, move up to the shoreline where that river channel was and collect samples. And, uh, you know, if all goes well, uh, some of those samples are going to get shipped back to Earth with another spacecraft later this decade. So this is really the first step 
in a long-range program to resolve the question, did life ever arrive on, arise on Mars? And by extension, could it have arisen elsewhere in the universe? So it's, it's, uh, it's got a big scientific payoff, potentially. It's such an exciting question because, of course, you know, Mars now is so inhospitable to life, and yet, you know, you could extrapolate that perhaps Mars was at one point in very, very distant history uh, a victim of climate change of its own, if it turns out that there was some sort of life on Mars. Well, there's no question about that. Uh, the earlier spacecraft have shown conclusively that Mars was once a warmer, wetter world. Organic compounds were present. They know that. The question is, did they ever assemble themselves into some kind of microbial life? You know, it's interesting that three and a half billion years ago, the oldest undisputed uh, examples of life on Earth are found in rocks like some in Western Australia, where these uh, single-celled organisms left these uh, sedimentary deposits called stromatolites. Uh, there's no question they were there. And at that same time on Mars, Jezero Crater had a lake in it. The water was flowing on the surface. Uh, there were organic compounds. So the question is, did that happen then? As you say, uh, Mars underwent a severe uh, form of climate change. It lost its magnetic field, most of its atmosphere. Uh, the water uh, disappeared. Uh, and it's, it's, like you said, a very inhospitable world today. And regardless of the question of microbial life, uh, Perseverance is going to continue uh, the effort to understand that Martian environment and try to help figure out what did happen to this planet to turn it into the world we see today. And the importance of that is accelerated by what we're going through on our own planet. Bill, how deep are they going to have to drill to get to what they, uh, you know, hope to find? Well, they're not drilling particularly deep. They have a robot arm on the rover that has a, a, a kind of a core sample type device on it uh, that will drill down to the rock. Uh, we're talking about uh, collecting samples that are a few inches long, if you think about it like that. Now, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet that makes this such a complicated mission, uh, the rover is equipped with a system internally that will take those samples. There's this carousel mechanism inside that will put those samples into these lipstick-sized containers, seal them. These are, you know, hermetically sealed, as it were. And then they're going to place them on the surface of Mars in very carefully documented positions so that a future spacecraft can land there, go collect these samples, fire them back up into Mars orbit. A European spacecraft then will pick them up, bring them back to Earth for analysis. So uh, it's really, they really believe that you've really got to get these samples back to Earth for the kind of laboratory analysis that really could resolve this question of, of past life once and for all. I mean, it may be able, the rover may be able to do that on its own, but they want to get those samples back uh, to really conclusively get a better idea of what's going on, what happened there three and a half billion years ago. Fascinating. So then what's going to happen to the rover once it leaves those little lipstick size capsules on the surface <laughs> of Mars? Well, it's going to take a long time to do that. And one of the things they want to do uh, is leave those samples at different points. So they've mapped out a, a possible route for the rover. It's about 15 miles long. It has a nuclear sort of generator on board, so it's going to have enough power to go for years. The design life is two Earth years, one Martian year, but they fully expect it to go longer than that. And if it can traverse this entire uh, sort of path they've kind of notionally laid out, it'll get samples from that lake bed sediments uh, up on top of that river delta and maybe all the way up to the river channel itself. And they'll, they'll deposit multiple caches on the surface. That's going to take years uh, to complete. Uh, so by the time that the, the second spacecraft gets there to pick these samples up, Perseverance should still be operational. Uh, you might even get a case where, wow. uh, you know, you, 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 could, you could film this thing coming down and see it taken off. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> it's so cool. You're absolutely right. Well, Bill Harwood, thanks for your time. And thank you so much for telling us all about uh, the exciting things going on up on Mars. Thanks so much.